Why do we worship? How do we worship? Is there a right or wrong way to worship? You're listening to the Youth Bible in One Year, day 319. In today's devotion, we are looking at the question of worship. Why should we worship and how should we worship? Well, we have three points here, and they are happiness, holiness, and humility. So let's find out how these three things come into play when we worship our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Why is worship important? What are you doing when you worship God? The writer of Hebrews urges us to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for your God is a consuming fire. The common theme in all three passages for today is Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, the holy mount of God. This is the place of the presence of God, where God is worshipped both in the Old and New Covenant. However, there's a difference between the two. You no longer have to go to a specific physical place to experience the presence of God. Because of Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, you can worship anywhere. Jesus is the one who has made this new relationship with God possible through his death on the cross for you and me. Your holy mountain where you can worship Jesus is the whole earth, and this anticipates the heavenly Jerusalem we read about in our passage from Hebrews, and which is described in Revelation 21, the new heaven and new earth. As you draw close to Jesus in worship, there are, as C.H. Spurgeon pointed out, three results of nearness to Jesus, happiness, holiness, and humility. From Psalm 126. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Happiness Children laugh, on average, 150 times a day. Adults laugh, on average, only six times a day. Jesus tells us to be more like children. The Christian faith uniquely combines laughter and tears, joy and and solemnity. We laughed, we sang. God was wonderful to us. We are one happy people. This psalm celebrates the return to Zion of the people who've been taken in captivity. They're so happy. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like those who dreamed they'd return to the holy mountain, Mount Zion. This was the place of the temple of God. This earthly salvation foreshadows the even greater salvation that you experience through Jesus. Like them, your response should be one of worship. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. There are plenty of tears in the Christian life. If life is tough for you at the moment, pray that God will restore your fortunes. If you are sowing in tears right now, there will come a time when you will begin to reap with songs of joy. Restore my fortunes, O Lord. May I find happiness, laughter and joy in your presence. New Testament From Hebrews 12 Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. 
If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. No, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven, who have now been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshipping him with holy fear and awe, for our God is a devouring fire. Second, holiness. More spiritual progress can be made in one short moment of speechless silence in the awesome presence of God than in years of mere study, wrote A.W. Tozer. Worship is coming into the awesome presence of a holy God on his holy mountain. Our God is a consuming fire. You're called to be like him. Make every effort to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Holiness involves effort. As Mother Teresa said, our progress in holiness depends on God and ourselves, on God's grace and on our will to be holy. You can decide to let Jesus make you holy. Relationships really matter. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Don't do anything that would cause you to miss out on the grace of God, to miss out on his holy presence. Keep a sharp eye out for weeds of bitter discontent. A thistle or two, gone to seed, can ruin a whole garden in time. Pull out the roots of bitterness as soon as you detect them. We have a responsibility for ourselves and for each other. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who in a moment of madness threw away so much for instant gratification, trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. Look at the contrast between the physical mountain where the law was given in the Old Testament and the heavenly Mount Zion where you now come to worship God. Think about the extraordinary display of God's holiness which accompanied the giving of the law and which left even Moses terrified. Every time you worship, you are surrounded by thousands upon thousands of angels and the very presence of the living God. All those who've died in Christ join in the heavenly worship. You join with billions of Christians alive now and those in heaven. Supremely, every time you worship, you've come to Jesus, who makes all this possible. The murder of Jesus, unlike Abel's, a homicide that cried out for vengeance, became a proclamation of grace. The blood of Christ brings a message of cleansing, forgiveness and peace with God to all who place their faith in him. As you come to worship Jesus, do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God. Lord Jesus, Thank you that I can come into your presence through your blood shed for me on the cross. Help me to be holy and to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Old Testament from Ezekiel 28-29 In the pride of your heart you say, I am a God. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. But you are a mere mortal and not a god, though you think you are as wise as a god. By your wisdom and understanding you have gained wealth for yourself, and because of your wealth your heart has grown proud. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. 
Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence, and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. Third, humility. Holiness and humility are inextricably linked. Jesus showed us that at the heart of holiness is humility. On the other hand, pride is at the root of all sin. It was pride that led to Satan's downfall. According to the biblical worldview, behind the evil in the world, there lies the devil. The Greek word for devil, diabolos, translates the Hebrew word Satan. We're not told very much about the origins of Satan in the Bible, but this passage is one of the few that might give some hint of the origin of Satan. Although the original context is the fall of the king of Tyre, it seems that Satan, the ruler of this world, was behind the ruler of Tyre. Read alongside Isaiah 14 and Revelation 12, it appears that both humans and Satan were created good. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. It appears that Satan was an angel. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. Satan had access to the throne of grace and to the presence of the Lord. He was blameless in his ways. Instead of worshipping God on the mountain of God, his heart became proud, going around saying, I'm a God, I sit on God's divine throne, ruling the sea. He was trying to be a God. By your great skill and trading, you've increased your wealth, and because of your wealth, your heart has grown proud. Just as great skills and wealth can lead to pride, so can good looks. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. This is a description of self-worship, which happens when we put our success down to our own wisdom, skill, and abilities without realizing that these things come from God and that we should worship him alone. Instead of worshiping the sovereign Lord, the temptation is to worship success, wealth, and beauty, the gods of our culture. They are God pretensions. God brings down the proud and exalts the humble. As a result of his pride and sin, Satan was expelled from the presence of God. You sinned, so I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, so I threw you to the earth. Satan's final destruction is assured. Jesus defeated Satan by his death and resurrection. The attitude of Jesus is the complete opposite to that of Satan. He took the opposite path, who being in very nature God, made himself nothing. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Worship Jesus today. As you draw close to him throughout your lifetime, you will experience these benefits, happiness, holiness and humility. Lord Jesus, today I bow my knee to worship you and confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. Pepper adds, Hebrews 12 verse 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We have to work at living at peace with everyone. Insecurities, misunderstandings and failures often get in the way. And as for being holy, well, there's a bit of a challenge. Let's worship Jesus today. Put on some worship music. Find a space to do something creative. Do worship in your workplace or in your school. Wherever you are, you can worship Jesus today based on what you do by giving it your all and recognizing that what you're doing is for him.